Welcome back to the True Crime Lounge Podcast here on Spotify and YouTube. I do have a Patreon that you can go and join for early access to episodes scheduled to come out. I also have a merch shop for all your true crime gear. For any updates on my channel or podcast, you can find me on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. With all that being said, let's jump into today's episode, shall we? Today we are going to be talking about the case of Mara Moray, an unsolved missing persons case that can get so big and invites a great deal of media attention. Mara's case is perhaps one of the most famous and mysterious persons um, cases in recent history. The University of Massachusetts Amherst students disappeared on February 9, 2004. In the days leading up to the disappearance, Mara told the university staff um, and her professors that she would t- be taking a week hiatus from school to handle a family emergency. Around 7.30 that night, a car crash on Route 112 was reported to 911, and the first responders first arrived to the driver, M- Mara, was nowhere to be found. And during the investigation, law enforcement turned up an eyewitness who had passed Mara following the crash. And when asked... If needed help, that she called, she said no, and that she had called for roadside assistance. In a window less than 15 minutes, something happened to Mara. What? This is probably the most puzzling part about her disappearance um, in her story. About her family having a family emergency, and that could not be corroborated by her family. So the question remains, why was Mara taking a week hiatus from her education? What could be so important and what so important in her disappearance is regarded as the first missing persons case in social media age. Having disappeared a week at Facebook lunch, her spawn many, and if you remember though, here's the thing. Facebook was uh, really meant for college students at the time. Um, but her story has spawned many true crime specials, documentaries, and highly popular podcasts called and a highly popular podcast called Missing Mara Missing Mara Murray. It's actually really good. I do recommend you going to check it out. Um, but we're gonna talk about the disappearance of Mara. Mara was born May fourth, nineteen eighty two. She disappeared on the evening of February 9, two thousand four, after a car crash on Route one twelve near Woodville, New Hampshire. To this day, her whereabouts remain unknown, and she was 21, a nursing student, completing her junior year at the University of Massachusetts Amherst at the time. Let's dig into her background now. She was born May 4th, 1982 in Hanson, Massachusetts. She was the fourth child of Frederick, who went by Fred, and Lori Moray. She has an older brother, Fred, two older sisters, Kathleen and Julie, and a younger brother, Kurt. Maureen was raised in an Irish Catholic household. She was, when she was six, her parents divorced, and after which she lived primarily with her mom. She graduated from Whitman Hanson Regional High School, where she was, st- where she was a star athlete on her school's track team. She accepted the United States Military Academy in West. What well, she was accepted there, in West Point, New York, where she studied chemical engineering for three semesters. She left West Point believing that she, it, she was not a good fit for it. And from what I've been told about West Point, it's like, it's kind of different like from most colleges you go to. Yes, the tuition is free, but um, I was call, listening to a podcast where, it, I can't remember what case it was, but her and her sister both went, and they both had kind of a different experience with West Point. Back to the case. After her freshman year, she transferred to the University of Massachusetts Amherst to study n- nursing. Prior to her disappearance um, in Amherst, where she was um, in November 2003, three months before her disappearance, she admitted to using a stolen credit card to order food from, from several restaurants, including one in Hadley, Massachusetts. The charge was continued in December, was um, to be dismissed after three months of good behavior. On the evening of February fourth, two thousand, February fifth, two thousand four, 
she, while she was on duty at her campus security job, Mara, uh, Mara spoke on the phone with her older sister Kathleen, and they discussed the relationship problems. About 10.30 p.m., while still on her shift, she reportedly broke down in tears when her supervisor arrived at her desk and said that Mara was just completely zoned out, no reaction at all, and she was unresponsive. The supervisor had escorted her back to her dorm room about 1.20. When asked what was wrong, she said two words, my sister. The contents of the call remain unknown to October 20, 2007. When Kathleen publicly explained that Kathleen, an alcoholic, was discharged from rehab, Clint was recharged discharged from a rehab clinic that evening, and on her way home, and her fiance took her to a liquor store, which caused an emotional breakdown. On Saturday, February seventh, her father Fred arrived in Amherst, and he told investigators he and Mari went car shopping that afternoon, and later went to dinner with a friend of his daughter. With a friend of his daughter, and Mare dropped her father off at the motel room and borrowed her own his Toyota Corolla, returned to campus to attend a dorm party. She arrived at 10.30 p.m., and at 2.30 a.m. on Sunday, February 8th, she left the party. At 3.30, en route to her father's motel, she struck a guardrail on Route 9 in Hadley, causing $10,000 um, worth of damage. To her father, the responding officer wrote an accident report, but there was no documentation of the failed sobriety test being conducted. Maria was driven to her father's motel and stayed in the room for the rest of the morning. At 4.49 a.m., there was a cell phone call placed to her boyfriend from Fred's phone. The participants in the contents of the phone call is unknown. Later Sunday morning, Fred learned that the damage to his vehicle would be covered by his auto insurance. He rented a car, dropped Murray off at the university, and departed for Connecticut. At 11.30 that night, he called his daughter to remind her to obtain accident forms from the Registry of Motor Vehicles. They agreed and talked again Monday to discuss the forms and fill out the insurance form claims via cell phone. So, now we just, let's jump to February 9, 2004. After midnight on Monday, February 9, she used her personal computer to search MapQuest for directions to Berkshire House in Burlington, Vermont. The first reported contact Mara had with anyone was on February 9th was at 10 p.m. She emailed her boyfriend saying, I love you more, stud. I got your message, but honestly, I don't feel like talking to, too much to anyone. I promise to call today, though. Love you, Mara. She also made a phone call inquiring about renting a condo at the same Bartlett, at the at the same Bartlett, New Hampshire condo association in which her family had vacationed in the past. So the phone records indicate that the call lasted three minutes, and the owner did not rent condos, to, did not rent a condo to her. At one thirteen p.m., she called a fellow nursing student for reasons unknown. On, a, on the afternoon of Monday, February 9th at 1.24 p.m., she emailed a worship supervisor at her school faculty and said that she would be out of town for a week due to a death in the family. According to her family, the, fam the family had not experienced a death, and she also would contact them um, when she returned. At 2.05 p.m., Mara called a number which provides records of a booking of a booking hotel in Snow, Vermont. The last call was approximately five minutes at 2.18, and she telephoned her boyfriend and left a message, promising him that they would talk later. The call ended after one minute. Mara packed her clothes and toiletries, college, book, college textbooks, birth control pills, and when her... And when her room was searched later, campus police discovered most of her belongings packed in box and the art removed from the wall. And it was clear, not clear whether she had been packing, she had packed in for the day. But police at the time noticed that she was packed between Sunday night and Monday morning. On top of the boxes, there was a printed email on Maury's boyfriend indicating that possible trouble in the relationship. At around 3.30 p.m., she drove off to campus 
in her black 1996 Saturn sedan. Classes at the university have been canceled that day due to a snowstorm. At 3.40 p.m., she withdrew $280 from the ATM, um, and closed-circuit footage shows she was alone. At a nearby liquor store, she purchased $40 of alcoholic beverages, including Bailey's Irish Cream, Kahlua, Vodka, and a box of Franzia wine. Security footage shows where she was alone and when she made that purchase. At some point, she also picked up accident reports from the Massachusetts Registry of Motor Vehicles. Mara then left Anhurst between 4, 4 and 5 p.m., presumably via I-91 North. She called to check her voicemail at 3, 437, the last recorded use of her cell phone. To this date, there is no indication she had informed anyone of her destination or any evidence that she had been the cho- that she had chosen one. Now let's talk about her disappearance. Um, was it the report of the car accident? Some sometime after seven p.m. in a, a Woodsville, New Hampshire resident heard a loud thump on the road. Through her window, she could see a car against a snowbank along Route One Twelve. She also known, which was also known as the Wild Ama Amon Nusik Road. And the car pointed on the eastbound side of the road. The local woman reported to the car accident on a short corner adjacent to her home, telephoning the Grafton County Sheriff's Department at 7.27 p.m. to report the accident. According to the 911 log, the woman claimed that to have never been to have seen a man smoking a cigarette and however she later claimed that she had not seen the man smoking a cigarette, but rather that he appeared a red glowing from inside the car, potentially a cell phone. A passing motorist, a school bus, um, who lived nearby, stopped at the scene and he saw the car and saw a young woman um, walking around her vehicle. The school bus driver noticed a young woman who was not bleeding or visibly injured, but cold and shivering. He offered to call for help, and she asked, and she asked him not to call the police. Um, knowing there was no cell reception in the area, the bus driver continued home to call and called the police, and received by the sheriff's department at 7:43 p.m. He was unable to see Moray's car while he made the car call. But he did notice several cars pass, and before he the police arrived, another local resident driving home from work claims that she, that she passed the scene around 7.37 p.m. and saw a police SUV parked face-to-face in Morris' car. She pulled over br- briefly to see if anyone was inside the car and decided to continue home. The witness's statement contradicts the official police log which has Haverhill police arriving nine minutes later. So, so around 7.46 p.m., the police would arrive at the scene. Um, according to the police official log, it was about 7.46. A Haverhill police officer arrived at the scene, but the woman, but the woman driver had disappeared. No one was inside or <clears throat> at the scene, but the woman driver had disappeared. No one was disappeared around the car, and the car had impacted the trees and drivers at in the vehicle, severely damaging the headlight and pushing the car's radiator, rendering inoperable. The car's windshield was cracked on, on the driver's side. Both airbags had been deployed, and the car was locked. Inside and outside the car, uh, the officer discovered red stains that looked to be wine. However, inside the car, he found many empty beer bottles, a damaged pack of pranzia in the seat. In addition, he found the AAA card that was issued to Moray, a blank accident report, gloves, compact disc, diamond jewelry, and driving directions to, to Burlington, Vermont. Moray's favorite stuffed animal, and not without peril, a book, 
about mountain climbing in the White Mountains as well. Missing were her debit cards, credit cards, and cell phone, none of which have been located since her disappearance. The police officer reported that some of the bottles purchased at the liquor store was missing. Journalist Joe McGee, riot in Quincy, Massachusetts, summarized that her car hit a tree, and at that point, a person who came along driving the bus. So police traced the vehicle and initially treated her as a missing person, on the belief that she may have wanted to disappear voluntarily. So the speculation was based on her travel preparations. In 2009, her case was given to the New Hampshire Cold Case Division, and the authorities are handling it as a suspicious missing persons case. At 8 o'clock to 9.30 p.m., allegedly so there was an alleged sighting between sighting. A contractor was returning home from Fran Franconia and saw a young person um, quickly on foot eastbound of Route 112, about 45 miles east of where her vehicle was discovered. He noted that the young person was wearing jeans, a dark coat, a light color hood, and he did not report it to the police. Immediately, due to the conf own confusion of the dates, only discovering three months later, while reviewing his record work records, that the young person he saw that night was Mara. The responding officer said that the the responding officer and the dr bus driver drove along the area searching for her. Just before 8 p.m., ENS and the fire truck arrived, claiming to clear the scene. By 8.49, the car had been towed to a local garage, and at 9.30, the car had the responding officer left, a rag believed to have been part of her emer Mars emergency roadside kit, and was discovered into a Saturn muffler pack pipe. And authorities said that referred to Mara as simply missing at 12 p.m. the next day for 24 hours, after the last confirmed sighting of her. Alright. That's part that's it for part one of this episode. I will see y'all in part two.